Radnor Memorial Library, everyone. Uh, it's so nice to see you all. My name is Pam Sador. It's a beautiful evening, and I'm so glad that you're joining us tonight. Dr. Frick is here, Dr. Ava Frick, and this is part two of Dr. Ava's presentation for Tales and Tales, and that's our summer reading club theme, but the um, we're calling this event Conversations with Animals. And this is the title of Dr. Ava Frick's new book. And I'm proud to report that the library finally received its copy. So if you were interested in borrowing it in the future, you could do that. So again, thank you all for coming and I welcome you. Dr. Ava Frick is the author of Conversation with Animals from farm girl to pioneering veterinarian, and it is called the Dr. Ava Frick Stories. Story. She has authored many magazine and newspaper articles, hosted radio shows, and of course, hours of public speaking. Dr. Ava educates and entertains pet owners, horse trainers, veterinarians, and just about anyone interested in helping themselves or their animals. It could be nutrition, herbs, pain management, animal chiropractic, and rehabilitation. And tonight, through the magic of Zoom, we present part two of our series. And Dr. Frick will be talking about pet nutrition in the 21st century and reducing the likelihood of chronic disease and cancer. So thank you, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ava. I'm gonna hand it over to you and thank you everyone. What we'll do is we're gonna do what we did last time, which is to stay muted. Or did we, Dr. Ava, do you mind if we interrupt or should we go through the presentation? What do you think? Well, the way we did it last time was did the program and then we yeah. opened it up at the end for Okay, questions. I think that's best because you know authors, have preferences, but I kind of like that. So if we'll stay muted and then Dr. Ava will give her presentation and then we'll be able to do a whole lot of talking at the end. So thank you very much for coming. Hi, Dr. Ava. Hello, Pam. Thanks for having me back. The first one was a lot of fun and I think everybody will find this one pretty interesting too. So the part about the pet nutrition in the 21st century, there's a lot of change that's happened with individual perception of how do they want to take care of their pet and people are morphing towards wanting to do more of that home care and home food and so that's really where this program came about is being able to create a foundation of healthfulness with nutrition and looking at some specific unique dna that would be created via the breeds that are in your dog or cat and, and how you look at that. And if we can get on top of this early enough, you really do have the opportunity to prevent a lot of the cancers that come about. So the program is gonna be in three zones. First, we're gonna talk about in order to improve lives, we have to look at what they're eating. And then we wanna look at where they go because there's all kinds of things that they can pick up in the environment and on their feet. And then we're going to look at correcting what's happened along the way. So that's the three parts. So can everybody see the, the pictures that's on the screen? Okay, good. Because I'm seeing people, which is fine by me, but I just wanna make sure everybody else can see what's there. Because we'll talk a little bit about that. So there's a lot of change in regards to what we're feeding our pets. People have realized that processed food is not necessarily quality nutrition. Like if you ate pre-processed foods out of the box and all you had to do was put it in a pot and add some boiling water, you know that that's not so healthy. And while it uh, began in the 1950s that the pet food companies ramped up a pretty good uh, mantra of being able to get everybody to, real, to think at that point in time that whatever's in the bag of food is everything they need. But that's not really the case. 
There are oftentimes recalls that can happen on processed foods because of different kinds of contaminants. Whereas if you're feeding something of more quality or cooking at home, you don't have to worry about those. Owners have actually quit believing that the bag is better than what's on the table, although there's certainly plenty of veterinarians that bought into that too. And uh, people oftentimes when I'm visiting with them, they're almost afraid to say, oh, they feed table food. And I say, well, table food's fine. It, it, as long as it's not just the pizza crust, you know, if, if you're giving them meat and vegetables and, and the good food that you're eating too, not just the donuts, the pizza crust and potato chips, then you have a chance of creating a healthier body. Because within them, their little computers that they were born with is, is programmed to be able to digest and process certain kinds of nutrients. And their computer from thousands of years ago doesn't really know about processed foods. There's also been plenty of connection between cancer and lifestyles and what they eat. We definitely know the carrageenan, which is a thickener that's put into a lot of the uh, canned moist kinds of food. Carrageenan has been shown to cause bladder cancer in terriers, especially Karen terriers. And so why should this be allowed to still be in the food? And they say things below a certain level, but if we know it causes any harm, then overall it's not safe and it's not good. So you have to become a label guru and learn how to look at the labels and the ingredients. And if there's the longer the list, you got the potential, especially if there's things that you don't recognize, then it's probably not as much of a quality food. And it doesn't have anything to do with the price that you pay for the bag. There can be very expensive foods out there that are not quality foods. So a time of change has come. Some of the things we wanna look at that, that happens with the food. Meat meal is certainly not as good a quality as having real meat. So the real chicken, the, the real meats. Meat meal can be, uh, is a broken down form of the meat. So it's not going to give all of the nutrients that real meat would. And then there are a lot of ingredients that can be added, preservatives, emulsifiers. Emulsifiers are the things that break up the food. So the food starts in big chunks, but it has to be processed in a way that every kibble piece or every can, every part of the can is gonna have the same type of thing in it. And so the emulsifiers take the great big pieces and make it into a slurry. Sometimes they'll add colorings. You've probably seen some of the, the uh, uh, Beneful is one of those that has little round bits in the, in the kibble that's dyed green. Well, they do that to make it look like a pea, but it's not a pea. And the dog doesn't get peas. And my dog used to always pick the peas out when I give him peas. In the end, you'd have these peas all around the mall. He didn't like peas. And any kind of dyes or food coloring is not going to be healthy in the food. Natural flavorings doesn't even mean that it's really natural. It just it's, it's, uh, can be like beef flavoring as a chemical made in a factory added to the food that has the flavor of beef, but it's not really beef, but it would be listed as a natural flavoring. MSG is also a natural flavoring. And so we wanna to try to avoid foods that have that. Uh, guar gum is a thickener that's used in the foods. Agar agar is a, little, is a better type of a thickener. And then there's the carrageenan uh, in robing. So this is what happens in the, most of the, the kibble foods. They, they go through um, what is called an enrobing process. So after the kibble is made, then there are fats sprayed onto the food and on top of the fats, then would be these extra vitamins and minerals so that the company can say on the label, there's this much of a nutrient and it's what's in the spray that's put on the top of the food, which is why many of the foods, if you look at them, you put them on a piece of paper, it doesn't take very long and you got a nice greasy spot. Well, that grease is coming from the fats that are sprayed on. And then certainly even with the fats that are sprayed on, they have to have antioxidants to keep the fats from going rancid while they're there. So a lot of things happen to the, the foods and any food that has a plant material in it. So whether it's rice or oats or barley, uh, unless it says on there that it's organic, then you've got a pretty good chance that in the growing of those plants, there were pesticides, herbicides that were used, uh, fertilizers in the ground, and then that comes up into the plant. And so 
while it may be there as a reason to kill off bugs, it ends up in the dog food. And now your our cat food, your animal, is uh, consuming these things on a daily basis. So you want like the picture. You want it to look like something you recognize. So we wanna look at ways that you can feed them healthier. And so one is to look at the archetype feeding. If we look at that, basically dogs in the real world would eat less than 25% carbohydrates. So it would behoove us to keep their balance because that's how the liver and the pancreas and the whole digestive process, it's what's going to keep those organs functioning better. Cats are, are less than 10% carbohydrates. They are a carnivore. Dogs are on omnivorous carnivores, so they can eat vegetables and they'll eat weeds and plants and different things too to balance out their diet. But cats are pretty much eat the bird, eat the mice, you know, catch the squirrel, whatever. That, that's more of their diet. They're only going to get the amount of carbohydrates that might be in the stomach or the entrails of the bird or of the mouse that they're eating. Then another way you can feed healthier is to feed for the breed, especially for breeds that have not been in the United States for very long, that are, say, from Africa or Indonesia, other countries, and they've lived there for thousands of years. It's best to feed that body what it has been surviving on for a long time. So you can actually find, depending on like if you had a Labrador, what would they have eaten in England? You have the border collies, well, they're on the border of England and Scotland, what would they have eaten? Uh, St. Bernard's, you can look up the different breeds and find where they originally came from, how did they eat? And then that is another way to augment the health of that body. Then we can also look at Ayurveda, the different doshas, so vada, pitta, and kapha, anybody that studies that for themselves, there are different doshas within the India culture in their philosophy of health, which looks at all aspects from <clears throat> surgery and medicine, but also from foods as being the true medicines that help the bodies. And so these, these doshas then create certain types that then within those characteristics, everybody has a little bit of each of them, but whichever one is the most dominant or two maybe sometimes are more dominant, then that will affect you seasonally, but also affect how you process foods and how you get the nutrients out of them and how other systems within that body works. And so, Focusing on that is another way to feed, like by Ayurveda principles. And all of these on my website, there is a section under nutrition. And I, I break these down so you can expand on that and learn more about how would you do that for your animal and what kind of dosha does my pet have. You can also feed for the metabolic rate. So, so there are fast metabolizers, so they eat the food and really quickly it's gone. And then there are slow metabolizers where they get every single good out of everything that's going through there. And then the mix, which is a little bit of both. And these come about, these traits of digestion and metabolism have to do with how the endocrine system is functioning. What are the thyroid glands, uh, the adrenal glands? How are they functioning? That's what determines the metabolic rate of the body. So, so you can look at this as well. And then there are a lot of different types of food. So we start with raw, which is what the dogs would have eaten in the real world before he had um, machinery to process or ovens to bake. They would have eaten things raw. And that doesn't mean that you would have to prepare the food raw yourself. You can certainly buy it prepackaged by companies. There are many that make organic raw diets. Uh, the original company way back was called Barf. They're still available. So there's different, a lot of different ways that you can offer the, the raw. Even if it's one meal a day, it's better than no meals. The freeze-dried, dehydrated, air-dried, those are all other ways of providing pretty much a raw diet except for the liquids have been taken out of it in those methods. So the freeze-dried and the dehydrated, those are going to be little small chunks that, are, that will pulverize up easily. And uh, the air dried tend to be more like um, jerky, only in little small pieces. There are different companies that offer that. Then there's home cooking. 
and a lot of different ways that you can access recipes for that. I even do recipes specifically like if a dog has allergies and there's certain foods that they are only able to eat. And sometimes that can become very difficult to find a processed food or even a food that's a raw or freeze dried that maybe doesn't have something in there that they're sensitive to. So we can do home cooking and there's crock pot recipes and all kinds of ways to do those. And then they have now what are called lightly or gently cooked formulas that are out there on the market. So for the people who don't like having raw in their house, then they can offer this up. And also as the animal's body ages, a lot of times they can't digest, it takes more energy to digest the raw if it's cold than what it does if it's something lightly cooked. So sometimes for the geriatric crowd, going with those kind make it easier to be absorbed, especially if they're a slow metabolizer. Then you have the canned foods and some of those can be very good. Now you have to watch the labels because that's where some of the, like the guar gum, um, the emulsifiers and some of the other preservatives would come into the canned foods as well as the carrageen. So watching those labels. And then we have what the majority of people feed, which is kibble. Majority of the companies in the United States that make kibble is going to be what's called an extrusion process. And when it goes through extrusion, it takes whatever starches are there and actually magnifies it. And this is a big part of why we have so many diabetic animals, the dogs and the cats, is because of them feeding, eating that extruded diet with this really high starch carbohydrate content, which has challenged the liver and the pancreas for many years. And eventually it gets to the point where they can't function normally anymore. And so the pancreas isn't making the insulin, the liver isn't doing its signaling and its processing of the carbs. And so now the animals are diabetic and receiving insulin, but this can be prevented early on in life by, by feeding differently. So if you are in a situation where you need to do a kibble for whatever reasons, there are some baked companies, the companies that make a baked kibble. And that prevents the starch and the carbs from getting this really high sugar content in it. Currently, there's less than 10 companies that make those foods, but it is available in the United States. So this would be an ebook. Dr. Ruth Roberts, she has an ebook for home cooking. It's the original crock pet diet. And so people can access her through the name there and you can find her online and about her diets. And she has a lot of different recipes that you can put in your crock pot and then cook them for your, for your pets. So she's got several different programs and things that you can uh, access and utilize to help you if that's the way you wanna go. I thought since this is a library program, we should have some books on board here. So we will do that. Uh, these are the, the companies then currently that make the baked kibbles. So Lotus uh, is out of California, Stellan Chewy's is in the uh, Northern Midwest and some other companies that are listed here. The ones that I have primarily utilized and that I'm familiar with the most is the Lotus, the Stellan Chewy's, uh, the Well-Made and then the Wellness. Those are the ones that I've um, seen used, tested for people, that kind of thing. But some of the other ones, when I looked them up, it seems like their uh, formulas and their recipes could be quite good too. So we just wanna keep the starch and the carbohydrates down and make it as digestible as possible. Here's a couple other books, Unlocking the Canine Ancestral Diet, Steve Brown. He also, there is a, he has a food out at himself, Steve's Food. So some people may be familiar with him via that diet and the different uh, proteins that he has and the different formulas. So this is the one that talks about feeding the dogs like where they came from and what their body computer is comprised to, to know and be able to decipher. And then some natural nutrition for cats. I mentioned that they are obligate carnivores and so they should be treated that way. And I had uh, somebody uh, a few weeks ago who themselves is a vegan and she was I don't know, online or visiting with some friends and they got the idea that they could feed the dog vegetarian, but it's not gonna come out very good in the long run. These animals, even though you're vegetarian or a vegan and you don't 
like it yourself, they have to have it. And so there's some books there that, that are very good that would help you and they have recipes and ways to feed in them. Another one is the yin and yang, it's a nutrition book for dogs. And I had a client that uses this uh, religiously for her dogs and they've been doing really, really well. And I've seen the book and it's uh, got some very good recipes in there and it's very cleverly done, the number one bestseller. So another way that if you're wanting to look at how you can cook for your your pet, then, then this would be one. And the thing about it too, is that you don't have to like, it's not like you're cooking every day. You can actually make enough that can last. You could cook enough to last three or four weeks actually. I have some families that get the you know, certain weekend, this is the weekend to cook and they get it all, they get them all packaged up and then they're done for a month before they're back at it again. And that also gives you like the opportunity to find out which things you're pet really likes to eat and it's easy for you to change these recipes with the different seasons. So talking about the seasonal part of things, if, if you live where it's hot in the summer, which most places it's going to tend to be fairly warm. I mean, there are areas where even in the summertime, it's only in the 60s or 70s. But for the most part, as the temperatures rise, we don't want to feed them meat that have a lot of heat in that protein. So lamb and venison are very hot meat. And those are good for the winter time when you're trying to keep the body in the furnace stoked, but certainly not a protein that would be optimal to feed in the summer in an area where it's already warm because that furnace is going to get hotter inside. So you want to go to feeding cooler meats in the summer, which would be like duck is a cool meat and pork is on the cool meat side. There are some fish that are cool meats. So we want to look at feeding those in the summer so that they, they can chill. And then uh, in between seasons, you could go in the spring and the fall, you could use beef and chicken and turkey. Those are kind of medium types. And then in the winter time, if your word's cold, then add in the, the venison and the lamb. And that gives you some, some different protein changes, which is going to introduce to their body different opportunities of nutrients that they can glean from those. All right, so now we want to look at how we can decontaminate. So the organs of elimination, the way the body and ours is the same, gets rid of things that you don't want in there is either through the liver, and it's going to go out through the feces, through the kidney, so it's going to be presented in the blood to the kidney, and it would then go out in the urine. The skin is an organ of an elimination. The skin is actually the largest organ of the body. And so if we see the body eliminating via the skin, it could be sores, oozies, unhealthy integument. Here also the ear is a continuation of the skin. So things that are happening in the ears can also be a reflection of, of uh, elimination. And then the lungs. So you have something in your lungs, you cough, you spit it up, that's how you're getting rid of other things. So this is the four ways that the body's gonna get rid of something it doesn't want. So it's good we have four options, but we also have to realize that depending on what's going through the body, those organs may already be stressed and they only have so many miles or can only do so much work at a time. And so then they have to prioritize. And sometimes the heavy metals and the different toxins they're exposed to can actually build up in the body. So where do they get these? Dogs going outside, if you're taking them for walks, going down the street, uh, going to the parks. Uh, dogs that go to training centers, so you're going to have disinfectants, herbicides, pesticides, uh, dogs that are out walking on the street. If it's during a busy time of day, there's exhaust fumes, so they're breathing in those exhaust fumes. Uh, any animals that live with somebody that smokes, they're going to have secondhand smoke, and cadmium is uh, very high in uh, tobacco, so they would also then potentially build that up in their tissue. So one of the first things you want to do is wash the dog's paws at night. The last thing when you're coming in, they're, they're done going out for the day, is to wash those paws. And you can use a, if you want to use like a Dawn detergent, that's used on a lot of ducks and that that's in the ocean that get grease on them. We just want to have something that washes it off. A lot of that, if you want to go more natural and safe, there are a lot of essential oil companies that have different soaps that would have detergents of like a, you could have a lemon in it, which will help defat and help get the grease off of something. 
And you can also use um, other essential oils that are also protective or immune stimulating. We also want to bathe the dogs. There's some dogs that people don't ever bathe them or don't bathe them, but when they go to the groomers every four months or twice a year, well, just like dust and pollen lands on your furniture, it lands on the body of the dog too. And we're, we take baths and showers frequently. Well, now on all these things that land on them, then it gets into the pores, it gets absorbed into the body. And this is a way that you can help prevent more of these toxins from being absorbed. You can also use essential oil diffusers. So that would help with the lungs. So it could even land on the skin too, but you're breathing it in. It's going to help to decontaminate and clean up the, the lungs. And uh, there's also testing that can be done. So we, to test for toxic metals, we take a hair sample and send it to a laboratory. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about that in another slide or two, about how you can actually find out what's lurking inside from that perspective and then know if they're high enough to be causing problems and then work up to being able to do a detox program. Uh, a study was done with a house households and they looked at the dogs, the cats and the humans and they tested for different chemical compounds on all of them and across the board, cats that live in a household have 65% more chemicals in their body than what the humans or the dogs do. So if you think about it, the cats are the fastidious groomers. They're always picking it up and taking it in. They're also, they, they lay on the surfaces. They're closer to the ground. Uh, so a combination of, and they probably get bathed realistically less than even the dogs do. So, so cats then are going to have more of these chemical compounds that they're trying to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis than what anybody else does. So because people don't tend to bathe their cats, it can, it can accumulate that way. And so then that leads in the cats to have a lot of digestive and potentially also immune related problems because those herbicides and pesticides can actually take out of the body system minerals. I've seen uh, electron microscopy before where it was showing nerve cells in, in the presence of herbicides that were actually taking calcium out of those nerve cells. And then we look at glyphosate, which is Roundup. Roundup was actually designed in the 50s to be used to help as a chelator to clean out pipes. And it would then chelate out the, what, whatever it accumulated inside the lining of those pipes. Now it's being used all over as a weed killer, but certainly it gets into the food system and, and it blows in the air, it runs through the, the runoff of the ground. So a lot of people use it in their gardening. It can get into your yard. So even the people that say, oh, my animals don't go outside the yard. Well, it can get there. And so the glyphosate competes for minerals as well, because as a key later, it would take them out. And so it does that in the body. So you can have an, an overload of the glyphosate that is affecting the microbiome. So then they're really key to even making antibodies. You got to have those little live microbes there, and then uh, it interferes with digestive and the immune system. So this is where I wanted to talk a little bit about correcting what happened, which is taking a fur tissue, fur sample, and having an, a laboratory test run on this. Dr. Paul Eck is the founder of Analytical Research Labs, and he's the person that spent Oh, from the 30s, 40s, up to the 70s, before he opened his laboratory, testing hair samples and fur samples and finding out uh, what, what can we find from this that would help us to improve the health of lives. And I have this drawing here. It's basically just showing you how every mineral is connected to somebody else. This is just like that old song that the ankle bone's connected to the shin bone and the shin bone's connected to the knee bone. Every mineral is connected to another one in order so that they can maintain a balance. This is in the plant world, in the soil, but also in, in nutrients and in the body, this happens. And the hair, as it forms inside the follicle, is being bathed by the body fluids and anything that's moving through the body fluids at that time is what's feeding that hair. 
Then once it grows and comes out above the skin surface, it now has a cuticle layer that hardens. And it's like a crystal ball. It traps all the information about what was happening during a period of time of that life. So when we take that first sample and send it to the laboratory, we actually get a view, a window into that what had happened the past three months. Now, the past three months is accumulation of three months before that and before that and before that. It's like the Bible, who begat who? It goes way, way back, even to the mother. Babies, we like to think that little babies are born and they're, everything is perfect and they're this, this very healthy being, but actually babies are the dump site for everything the mother's body doesn't want. And so the mother's body will run out a lot of these heavy metals and toxins into the baby. And so babies aren't born healthy. I've done uh, hair samples on very young, like dogs and cats, and found even when they're 8, 10, 12 weeks old, severe deviations in their mineral balance and also sometimes very toxic levels of heavy metals. And if we don't get those out at an early age, that's going to be part of what creates the disease, what leads to the cancer, what leads to the unhealthiness, which you're going to spend the money to try to save them, but you can spend the money early in life with really, really good food and having the hair analysis and get rid of the bad things such that you're not spending the money on medications and laboratory tests and doctor bills trying to save their life. They just go through life being healthier and you don't have all of that day-to-day -day stress. So some of the aspects of the other researchers that went into creating the philosophy, what's behind hair tissue mineral analysis uh, was Hans Selye. And he is the, the doctor who looked at stress and looked at it from the autonomic nervous system, the adrenals, the thyroid, that 911 signal that the mind sends off to the body and the body is obligated to respond to it. So all of his research is a part of, of this science. Also, Dr. Melvin Page, he looked at the sympathetic and parasympathetic. So also the autonomic nervous system, but he looked at it from a little different perspective and looked at balancing those. And so we know, oh, there's a kitty. I see a tail. <laughs> uh, so, so if you've always got your 911 button going and you have a lot of tension in the gut, that sympathetic system isn't going to allow you to digest well. You could eat the best of food. But if you're sympathetic dominant, it's not going to happen. Parasympathetic is where in that state that nutrition can actually be assimilated. The food can be digest, processed, absorbed, and you get the most out of it. Dr. George Watson, he looked at the oxidation types, which is the metabolism. How fast does your body go inside? How slow does your body go inside? And you can't always tell by somebody's weight. You know, I used to think, oh, somebody's overweight, so they must be a slow metabolizer. Or they're really thin, they must be fast. Well, throughout body, depending on what you did mentally or to your body, you can become one of those that is not really who you are. So realistically, I should be a fast metabolizer because of how I function. But because of being type A for too many years and running myself ragged, my thyroid and adrenals got to the point that they're like, shut, cut her off. So I am actually a slow metabolizer. So I'm now this slow metabolizer in this fast metabolizing type of a body, but I have to eat for the slow metabolizer. If I ate for the other, it doesn't go well. So then Dr. William Albrecht, who was from University of Missouri, uh, he looked at mineral balancing and he is actually he, mostly about the soil is where he started looking at soil is where his field of expertise was, but he's the person who created then this mineral wheel that I have here. He did the con connected all the dots between all of those minerals. And so in combining all of this strategy, we have a well-documented scientific perspective to find out answers and to predict the future and create changes for, for ourselves and, and for the animals and even livestock and horses and uh, yes, in, in, in the food industry too, is like you could have something that goes through a whole chicken house, you know, what, what was it? And then being able to, through the feathers, find answers as well. 
So I put in here a little cat story. The, the, this is a, an example of, of a laboratory report. And Buddy, the cat, he was hanging out in the shelves at our office. I don't know. Can you see the arrow here? Or is it only on my screen? You can see me moving it? Yeah, I can see it, Dr. Okay. Dr. Clark, so, yes. So on this, this is what the printout of the test result looks like. And this black line is our optimal line. So we want all of these bars, the calcium, the magnesium, the sodium, the potassium, we want them to be as close to this line as possible. So the body will look at not only as something low, but it also looks at as what's high. Then in addition to looking at individual minerals, it also looks at ratios. So we have certain ones that like to be twins, like calcium and magnesium. They like to be together. And these two minerals as a ratio, which is at the bottom down here, gives us an idea of how the body deals with carbohydrates and sugars. Uh, the sodium to magnesium, this ratio tells us what the adrenal glands are doing. This ratio between these two tell us what the adrenal glands are doing from an energy perspective. And then the calcium to potassium tells us what the thyroid's doing. And then going across the board, I can tell you about protein digestion and whether or not they're sympathetic or parasympathetic. And then it also gives us a toxic metal read. So this cat had been treated for an extended period of time as a diabetic. He'd had a, an initial insult of a problem and then had some pancreatitis. And then he was being given insulin, but his body wasn't responding to the insulin. His sugar levels were still very, very high, like 400s to 600s. Uh, it wasn't doing anything. So so they have a condition where the body doesn't recognize the insulin. But when I got started with him, it's like, well, maybe it's not the pancreas at all. And it ended up that actually it was his liver. We addressed his liver, treated the liver, and then supplied the appropriate minerals and vitamins to correct this. And we looked down here, his aluminum was very toxic. So we, after some time of getting him corrected nutritionally and feeding the cells, we went after that aluminum. And uh, within, well, they quit the insulin within about three weeks, and then we monitored him. And then over the next six months, he got to where his blood glucose levels were totally normal all the time and uh, lived for many, many, many years after that. So this is an example of you can't go by what you see on the outside. You can't look at that body and go, oh, he acts healthy. He runs in plays. He must be okay. You, you can't assume that. And this is where the hair analysis as the crystal ball will show us really what the heck's going on inside before the disease starts. Because once the disease happens and the veterinarian runs some blood tests, which is that minute of the blood of that moment of that day, and you determine what's happening or the heart breaks down or the kidneys are in failure. Once you get to that point, that's the disease, but that's not what caused it. There's imbalances for a long time that get the body to the point where the seesaw can't keep up anymore, and then it tips in the wrong direction, and then you see the disease come along. So this is an area of forte of where I have researched and studied and treated for many years. I've been doing the hair tissue mineral analysis in animals now for 16 years. And so I felt a responsibility to write some more books and they are both now published. Uh, I, I felt like all these years that I've spent learning this and being able to care for animals in a different way, it would be sad if I didn't pass it on. So I have veterinarians that, that are training now on how to be able to interpret hair analysis in all parts of the US and the world in order to be able to better diagnose and treat their patients in a prophylactic way instead of uh, once it happens and then you're kind of behind the eight ball trying to catch up. And then the book on customizing nutrition is, is taking a, a little questionnaire, which is broken down into body systems. And within each of those systems, whether it's the sympathetic or parasympathetic, the endocrine, the liver, the cardiopulmonary, the kidneys, each of, each of those organs need certain nutrients. And based on which of those in the questionnaire have the 
the most, the highest percentage is going to give us an idea of where we need to start. And so I used that survey when I worked with Buddy the Cat. And that's how I could figure out between that and the mineral analysis that he wasn't really a diabetic. It was the liver that was having problems. It wasn't signaling the pancreas and the liver's responsible for digesting the carbohydrates and the B vitamin balances and all those things. So a couple other books that can be utilized if there's anybody on board at any time that's interested in learning more about the science or how to do it yourself. Nutritionists can work with the animals this way. And so there's a lot, lot of good to be gained. The ways then that we can look at reducing the risk of the chronic diseases and cancer, one would be to get that tissue mineral analysis done early in life and then follow it through every six months or once a year. Instead of having annual blood tests or along with annual blood tests, you can do an annual fur analysis. And then uh, as Barney would say, nip it in the bud, anything that comes along that looks a little bit skewed, you could catch it early on. Try to avoid kibble as much as possible. If you are gonna feed kibble, make sure it's the baked, but, but the goal would be to feel, feed more real food. And then feeding according to the metabolism, changing the proteins up with the seasons, uh, back to the archetype, the original style of feeding, balancing the proteins and the fats and the vegetables and all of those nutrients. And we also want to work at keeping a good weight. And I can say that that will be easier if they don't get into eating so much of that extruded kibble diet. Uh, obesity is a chronic disease and it, it uh, you know, a lot of the toxins are stored in fat cells. Unfortunately, the, the brain is like a fat cell itself, multiple cells. So we do have mercury and a lot of toxins that will aggregate to the nervous system. But the more fat that's there, the more likelihood that that body is going to retain more toxic entities and, and so chemicals. And so by getting the weight off, which is going to help with the joints and it's going to help with the liver function and the pancreatic function. So if we can do that, then uh, they're going to have a healthier life just by eliminating the obesity. And I'm sure a lot of people are very familiar with this from going to their doctors and hearing, oh, you need to lose 10 pounds or you need to take a, and it really, it's about what you buy and what's on the shelves. And I know it's hard to, uh, not sometimes want something that would be less optimal. So, you know, it's like, okay, you eat a couple of them, just don't eat the whole bag. It's really about changing um, the, the family, the home lifestyle as well, especially for kids. So the thing about the obesity is there's different kinds of fat cells. There are fat cells that if you get them when you're young, this is the same for animals and people, if that body develops obesity when it's young, those fat cells are there for life. And those are the individuals that unfortunately struggle with going on a diet, losing weight, and then it comes back so quick. It's because those cells have flattened, but they didn't go away. A body that develops obesity later on, those fat cells being new can actually totally be taken out of the body. And so it's easier to lose weight if you weren't obese as a youngster. So we need to look at that for our young animals and not let them get overweight young and kids not let them get obese when they're young because it'll be there for life and it affects everything about joints and function and liver and kidney and, and having that, that healthy life and being able to exercise. And it becomes that vicious wheel is that it's hard to exercise when your joints hurt and you're overweight, but how are you gonna get the weight off? Well, we do put dogs in the underwater treadmill to get them to lose weight. And I've had some cats that went in the underwater treadmill too to get them to exercise. because Otherwise that's not gonna be on their high end list of fun things to do in a day. I talked about washing those paws. We wanna definitely wanna wash those paws at nighttime, get all the bad things off of them. Uh, fitness in motion. So that is that the more you move throughout life, retirement's really not, somebody who retires and becomes stagnant, that's not a good, good thing. We wanna keep the body in motion. You gotta keep the nerve connections moving. And one of the ways that we do this is with a healthy chiropractic program. So again, we start animals young, certainly with injuries, you got two dogs that body blast each other. 
Uh, we've got the horses that uh, can have accidents. They fall doing a jump, they stumble. Cats are built a little bit differently. They're designed, this wasn't specifically what they were designed for, but it has been found that they can fall from a two-story building and when they land, they're okay. They didn't break their bones. Anybody else would have broken bones. So cats are very supple. Their joints are, are put together a little differently and they have this very good spring effect in them to jump out of the tree and oh, off your kitchen hutch or countertop or whatever. They can go all kinds of high places. But there are times when they also can become subluxated. So it's good to keep the body's alignment and not let these deviated joint segments start controlling how the rest of your body works. Because when we go down the spine itself, the bones in between those bones are openings where the nerves of the spinal cord exit out. So if the joints are distorted, then so is the nerve signaling messages to that area of the body that they're going to. So we want to keep everything as healthy from that perspective too. Uh, nutritional balancing, that's making sure that whatever supplements that you're feeding really are the right ones and they're compatible. Sometimes what can happen is that somebody is trying to do the right thing, maybe has three or four different supplements and every one of those supplements has vitamin C in it. Now in these dogs and cats and, that have, same for a person, you have a very low calcium and magnesium and a super high sodium is a very typical pattern, but vitamin C pulls calcium out of the tissue. So the last thing you wanna do when they're already calcium deficient is to give them a whole bunch of vitamin C, it's gonna pull more of it out. So even the good is not good in the wrong scenario. And the only way you're going to know which are the, the best ones, well, one is going to be to do the hair analysis. Other is to read those labels and make sure that you're not compounding the volume of something. And then there's also the uh, what's called kinesiology. And a lot of doctors will do what's muscle testing. It's using electrical potentials to determine what would be the best option when we look at foods or supplements or medications, even everything functions in life based on electricity. So we're looking at a wavelength, an amplitude, a waveform, a frequency, everything, every plant, they're a little bit different because they're a different setting of those, even though they're within still the same range of a wavelength on the wave band scale. So like you've got the far infrared rays and you've got the, the microwave band and then there's the radio band and then where the tv can come in and out and then you have the band where the majority of the mammals are going to be existing and as you move on down you get into the band where parasites exist and bacteria exist and then viruses exist and the lower you're pushed on these bands away from your optimal then you get into the bands where a lot of these other bad guys can, can exist so when we look at plants and we're using herbs and foods and minerals, everything has its own frequency band and we want to make sure that it matches and is the best for the whole body. Uh, so reducing vaccines, vaccines can also be very toxic to the body. When we look at animals that are vaccinated every year for like 15 years and we don't do that with people. You get the measles vaccine when you're younger. They do the chickenpox vaccine. It's not like you keep getting it every year. So um, there's the website there. Hopefully you can see that because on my screen it's blocked out. But uh, you can go to Vital Animals. It's uh, Dr. Will Falconer. He was a classmate of mine. He now lives in India. Oh, the vitalanimal.com. And uh, Will has some very good programs on his site to help give you the the broad perspective. Nowadays, you can do titer testing and you can actually have a blood sample drawn and then that goes to a laboratory and they can measure the antibody levels against whether it's canine distemper or the adenovirus, which is hepatitis or hair influenza or rabies, all those can be titer tested. And if the body already has plenty of immunity, then asking it to work more on that particular virus is not in the benefit of that individual's immune system. Mind the gut. That has to do two things. One is we want to have a healthier 
microbiome. We want to keep those microbes in the gut healthy. So there are a lot of different probiotics and ways to go about helping to keep that stable. Diet also has a lot to do with it. Stress has a lot to do with it. But also there's the mind-gut connection. So they've done, there's new research that's been published that looks at how the different changes in the microbiome can actually affect the mental state of that person. And so we would expect that same scenario to transcend into the animals too. There's definitely a mind-gut connection. We want to maintain a healthy immune system, keeping those bodies strong so that if they are exposed to any of the bad guys, they can fight it off without duress. It should be able to happen without you noticing that it's happening. And then we always want to try to reduce stress. And that's the part that, that uh, can be challenging nowadays with lifestyles as they are. Dogs like routines. They like to know. They know when you're supposed to be coming home. They can hear your vehicle down the road. Uh, cats even too. They'll be sitting at the door waiting for you to come home because it's probably their motive. You being there is when they're going to get fed again. So they're looking forward to that happening. And the dogs are looking forward to you being there. And they can. So, so when your routine is, is very irregular, that stresses them. Even like dogs that do agility and fly ball and shitsund and all those, even though they enjoy it, too much of exercise and too much of that can also push them the other way into that stress too much adrenal gland signal day after day, which is going to drive aldosterone high and it's going to create the high sodium in the body, which is not salt, it's sodium, which is related to the aldosterone production. And so that inflammation and all of that. So, so we want to try to, to take some of that go, go, go off of the adrenals and that'll help the body live a longer, easier life to help to digest better and all those kinds of things. All righty, so I've come to the end of my conversation part tonight. Uh, there's my website. This is the biography, which uh, Ronald Joseph Cool is the biographer, and I then he did the story part, and then I did the animal stories. Every veterinarian's got plenty of animal stories, and from a lifetime of being with them. So you know, we've got the humorous ones, and you've got the the ones that can touch your heart. Is, is in that book. So now would be the time we can open it up to questions. Right. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ava. So maybe what we did last time was I know um, we opened up the room and we minimized the presentation. Thank you for mentioning Ron Cool, because we know Ron Cool at Radnor Library and, and he's uh, the biographer, co author of many books uh the one chef tell is when we mm -hmm. met ron so yeah i want to say shout out to ron in florida <laughs> and through the magic of zoom there you are living in arizona and you're able yeah. to talk with us tonight so um questions anyone we do have time questions comments for dr ava dr ava i have uh, two questions if i could okay uh, number one, um, you have these uh, uh, dry foods that uh, you would recommend that are okay to say. Um, how about mixing in with those some of the good proteins, the uh, the meats, the chickens, and whatever? Uh, is that something that you would recommend? Is that something uh, that would be uh, you know a good idea? So you certainly can add in like. Say you had chicken and you wanted to add chicken to their food, you can certainly do that. Or if you had hamburgers that day and you wanted to give them some hamburger, you can feed them whatever. If you had broccoli or zucchini or any any veggies are going to be beneficial for especially the dogs. You know, the cats are not so likely to want to have as much vegetables, but they'll be happy to, to have the meat. Another thing on that too is that when you feed them, so if you've ever watched a dog when you, you give them something and they swallow it really fast and they look at you like, you know, it's like, where, where, where was it? You didn't even give it to me. And you're looking like, you know, like so, so we tell them to chew their food. Well, dogs don't really do that. They're a ripper. They swallow. Now they got this big old chunk sitting in their stomach. And that is important 
because the protein, the, so the meat, the protein, now it sits in the stomach long enough to get pre-processed by the pH, by the enzymes, so that when it leaves the stomach, it's ready, it's, it, it's opened up, and now the amino acids are available and the nutrients are available. Their intestinal tract is much shorter than ours. And so when we feed these foods that are like all chopped up really little and uh, encourage them in, in things that are pulverized, it doesn't really match as well with how their stomach really processes. So then what happens, it gets into the intestines and then it putrefies and then they have gas and then Everybody don't want to stay in the living room watching TV with them. <laughs> They're having that so, so, so uh, 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 this goes back to the archetype, you know, feeding the dog a great big piece and they swallow it and go, it's like, well, okay, you're going to digest on that for a while. Go think about it. Right. Okay. The second question was, let's say, uh, you know, we're having our regular meal of uh, chicken and uh, some type of uh, starch and a, uh, a vegetable. Uh, it's okay if uh, if I have broccoli of the consistency that I would want to eat broccoli. It's just okay to give them the uh, the broccoli of the same consistency. That's fine. You just have to you'll you'll find out if it is okay based on what the the bowel movements look like the next day. Okay. So some dogs can't even little bits of, of uh, carrot comes out looking like little bits of carrot. So okay. their metabolism it's going to depend on whether they're a fast mix or slow metabolizer. And so if their metabolism doesn't digest the raw carrot, now the cooked could totally be fine, then you know, okay, don't feed them carrots. You'll find out if they eat the broccoli, they like it, they eat it, and you don't see broccoli in their stool, yeah, then you're okay to feed that one that way. Okay. So you kind of experiment with the, uh, with the vegetables to see yeah. what's good. And the thing is, the more variety you introduce to them at an earlier age, the more adaptable their intestinal tract is and the easier they're going to be rolling through those variable meals all the time, which is really more optimal. So if they only eat the same thing every day, which is what happens with the bagged food, and then they find something different, well, their microflora is so um, detailed in just these few because that's all they ever ask that they need. Now they get something else in their system and they don't have the microflora to be able to deal with that. So that's when you get the animals having the indigestion and the problems with having what people call table scraps. I just call it table food or real food mm -hmm. um, when they haven't been fed that. So the best is to start them early, feed it often, and you'll never have a problem. Okay. Yeah. Boy, nutrition has come a long way. And we've learned even through um, people doctors who we learned didn't learn much about nutrition a long time ago. And so now they are studying nutrition and the same goes with doctors of veterinarian medicine. This is because um, you know, I'm older and I remember things like don't feed the dog people food and, you know, or don't bathe the cat. All the things that we thought have just done a, no, right around. Yes. A, a little bit of it, though, is like cycling back. Because if we go back to veterinary medicine or husbandry, what it would have been called, okay, prior to the evolution of drugs, right. everything was looked at like what nutrient is missing. If you had a herd problem, you had a skin problem, you had a hoof problem, you had whatever it was, right. a bowels mm -hmm. that they couldn't get the the, the BMs to look right. It was like what nutrient, what is toxic or what is missing? That's how the bodies were treated. And then when right. we came through the industrial revolution and then thank goodness penicillin was created, but right. as it morphed and there's more and more drug compounds, it became less focused on what's the real why and what do we give it to change this reaction? Mm -hmm. So it's a difference between putting out the fire or finding the arsenic. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a question. Mm -hmm. I have I have two <clears throat> Siamese cats, and um, they uh, sort of had uh, a poop problem, <laughs> you know. And uh, so my vet has suggested, and I've been using it for uh, over a year now. I started on one cat, and I now use it on both cats. Is 
lactulose. I don't know if you've ever heard of using lactulose. Yeah, yeah. There, he must have thought there was some kind of a liver. It's mostly used when there's liver related issues. Well, there, it, it's a sugar, isn't it? Does is you know, um, is it isn't it a sugar? Yeah, like like sucrose, glucose, lactulose. So yeah, now I that makes me wonder if it's going to cause a different problem because it is, you know, a sugar and I'm giving it to them every mm -hmm. day, a little bit every day. So yeah. that it does solve the problem. Their poop is not as um, dry and hard. It comes out better, you know. But what do you feed them? Um, they get uh, a canned food in the morning and uh, dried in the evening. But the one cat has the kidney disease, so um, he's supposed to be on the kidney care diet site. Different canned kidney cares I've been trying. Mm -hmm. I hate because he's um he's in stage three mm -hmm. uh, kidney disease. So um, sometimes he he's been difficult to uh, get him to eat. So my vet said just give him anything he'll eat. So sometimes I've um I've started giving him duck. He likes duck a lot. <laughs> oh, that's good. Yeah. Um, yeah, you got to uh, kind of find out because definitely with protein dysfunction too, you, you have to keep, I'm oh, sorry, kidney dysfunction, you have to keep their protein levels high enough. Otherwise you run into other issues and they start losing a lot of body mass and, and then that's deprived nutrition and then the kidneys will, will die off even quicker. Oh, okay. Um, well, I don't know. I just wondered what you thought about that. Yeah, but, my, my thing would be if they had some kind of GI problem, I'd go with, you know, like finding tripe if you wanted to do that. The things that would be like, what, what are they missing because they don't get to eat a mouse or they don't get to eat a bird? Mm -hmm. uh, Standard Process has a product, feline enteric support, and it actually has body parts in it. They're little tablets. My cat, she's older, she gets the feline renal for her kidneys, but uh, they have intestinal, kidney, and it actually has the body parts in there. So the cats generally like it pretty well. What so that's name? what I would do as opposed to lactulose. Could you say the name of it again? Standard Process Standard. is the company. They're in Palmyra, Wisconsin. They've been around since 1929. And in your area, there's quite a few veterinarians that handle Standard Process. And there's one called canine renal support, or feline, sorry, renal support, and then feline uh, kidney, um, enteric support. So the gut and then the kidneys. Mm -hmm. yeah. They have ones for the liver and for the immune and one called whole body. Yeah, they have several animal formulas. So they, they have food in there that's like mouse food, <laughs> pieces of mouse they're supplements they're supplements that you would give them that have concentrated body parts in them but you can go to standardprocess.com and look at the different products and read about it okay anybody else no you know i don't know why I'm, i find myself thinking about um you know the they say that people love their golden retrievers. And you know, John, uh, you had a golden retriever and they noticed that it's a very popular dog and it is bred, seriously bred for families because they're so wonderful and beautiful family dogs. But they've looked at the death rates of how, or the lifespan of this beloved family pet, this golden retriever, has gone down to where the average, was it 10 years, John? Something like that, yeah. Started out much, much higher. Mm -hmm. And they're trying to, uh, I guess people in your field, Dr. Ava, there's studies going on to analyze what's happening with this beloved dog, this, this very ultimate family pet that is bred and, and it's living 10 years. So is uh, uh, environmental? or not feeding them properly? What they knew since time immemorial? And what was that or what is that about? You a big wonder. part of it in my perspective is that any breed that's ever gotten super popular was diluted 
and became less healthy. So it happened with the Irish setters, they got really popular and there was the popularity was these narrow headed ones. And so they bred and bred and bred for skinnier headed dogs and ruined the Irish setters. The German shepherds were really popular at a point in time, a particular German shepherd was winning a lot and everybody wanted to breed to him and they wanted their dogs to move like him. Well, ended up that he moved that way because he had really bad hips. So that was the beginning of the whole hip dysplasia in the German Shepherds. The boxers used to be the breed that was considered the number one cancer. Like any kind of cancer out there, if you had a boxer, you were pretty sure they were gonna get it. And other dogs seemed to be safe from that. But the Golden Retrievers have gotten very, very popular. And, and the breeding, instead of outbreeding, a lot of times they continue to line breed. And so what you end up with are more recessive genes. You don't have the hybrid vigor what they call right. it. So that's why by having a mixed breed is oftentimes going to be a healthier, more stable because you get the hybrid vigor. As long as you don't pick one that has a diluted color. People like those lighter colored blue eyes, the really light blue gray color, the light fawnish color. Anything that's very diluted in color is probably in, in general a more recessive body mm -hmm. genetically wise. So you're going to have more immune problems, health problems, all of that. Right. Any other questions? Anyone? Any other questions, comments? Thank you, Dr. Ava. This is wonderful. And I'm so glad that we have your book. It's in the middle of being processed right now at Radnor Memorial Library. Thank you so much for coming. And um, I want to shout out to co-author, biographer, Ron Cool, and we'll talk about the next time Dr. Ava is with us, and that would be part three of our Conversations with Animals series, and that is on August 30th, and that is called Helping Senior Pets Age Gracefully and Keeping Their Older Bodies Mobilized, and we know that, just like you had in your list there. You got to keep moving. Yeah. <laughs> Try and eat right. Thank you. But See you then. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Frick. Thank you, You're everyone. Welcome. Thank you for coming. See you next time.